Very good. Thank you, Pastor Nathan. Good to have you out this evening. We'll be looking at Psalm 104 in just a moment. But thank you for joining us. Uh, I mentioned a few people this morning with some health issues. Uh, Pastor Brian just updated us with uh, Paula Duke. Um, We'll be in rehab for a number of days, weeks perhaps. Uh, He is open to visits, so if you'd like to touch base with him or Marilyn, um, that's available at this point. Uh, Janet Bone has been in the hospital. Pray for Janet. Has some respiratory issues uh, ongoing. Uh, tomorrow, Bev Spenner's going in for a surgery. Uh, we also have several other folks with just a lot, a lot of health issues uh, within our church family. Jonathan Rash is having some breathing issues and um, in not in good shape. So pray for Jonathan and Gerald Rash. We miss them today, and uh, do pray for our church family. So yeah, the Eagles play tonight. Um, it was years ago. I told you the story. I won't repeat it. Other than um, years ago, when the Eagles were playing Oakland in, in the Super Bowl, the Lord really dealt with me that I shouldn't be watching football. I should be in church, and I just made that decision that night, and I've never turned back. And I don't want anything. Um, there's only one thing maybe that has a grip on me. I need to work through, but I don't want anything to have a grip on me on my life. Uh, sports no longer does. I, I, I broke that spell back in 19. Uh, I think that was 81. <clears throat> The only thing I need to work on is probably coffee. So, you know, that's a problem. Um, I think I could go without it. I I do think I can go without it. Uh, But I I really do like coffee in the morning, just a cup and a half every day. Uh, So I probably should break that pattern for a little bit to see that it doesn't have any dominion over me. So we don't want anything controlling us other than the Holy Spirit. And um, so I probably should do that. But anyway... Um, I have a lot of friends in Philadelphia. I stay in touch with a number of them, and they're really serious. They are really, really serious. And I have a lot of fun teasing them and going back and forth with some communication. So uh, I do miss Philadelphia. Uh, it's, a, it's a rough city. It's a blue-collar city. Um, they're terrible fans, terrible fans. Um, there's sections of the city, you know, growing up we wouldn't go through. And if we had to go through some of them... Um, for whatever reason, was doors were locked, you know, windows up, even though, though it was 100 degrees in the middle of the summer in non-air-conditioned vehicles, and we never owned an air-conditioned vehicle. So uh, we would go through Philadelphia, through Chester, to go to the, uh, there was a, uh, help me out, Karen, the, what was it there that goes over to New Jersey? The ferry, the ferry, the ferry. So I was always scared to go over those big bridges, so we took the ferry. So that means you waited uh, to load your car onto the boat, and then they took you across the, the river there, the, the, I think it was the Shore Kill, um, was it the Shore Kill or the, uh, the Schuylkill River? Yeah, the Shore Kill Expressway, Schuylkill River. And we would go across there, and then you get off your car, and then you're into the Garden State. So a uh, lot of fond memories of, of Philadelphia life. Um, I don't miss it. I don't miss it. Uh, we are blessed to be in Colorado. This is a beautiful state, and uh, we are really, really love it. Well, tonight, in probably a couple weeks, I'm doing um, a little bit of a creation theme. I'm, I'm kind of honing in my, my knowledge and skills to work with the mining students on Friday nights. They're very intelligent. Um, they're very good on the science side of stuff, and this, this is my weakest side. So I've been just doing a lot of extra research to try to be uh, knowledgeable, to talk uh, intelligently with them, and hopefully get the gospel to these students. Uh, they've been extremely respectful, very open. Uh, we had another, I wasn't there Friday night, but we had a good turnout again. And we're just seeing some neat things happening there at the mines. Very impressed with the, with the student body and their openness to coming to a study on a Friday night. So, so what a blessing. So I've been just meditating on some of the psalms and uh, the creation theme uh, within them. So uh, I'm going to read the 104 psalm. And then uh, I'm going to go X number of minutes in my sermon. I can go an hour maybe. Um, and then we're going to watch a little bit of a video uh, on on some reasons we believe in a from a scientific viewpoint why we believe in a young earth, young earth and a, a catacly- cataclysmic flood and so we'll just do a little bit of that video tonight with Dr. Snelling and also a reminder we will be going Lord willing to the Grand Canyon in April if you would like to go we did have an informational meeting but it's not too late to show interest and we can get you on the sign up sheet hopefully by the end of the month okay Psalm 104 I think it'd be good just to read it first and let it sink in. It's, it's a masterpiece, as they all are. Uh, but this psalm has so many unique features to it. I'll highlight a few. But it's, uh, you might have in your notes, I've got a 
an old Schofield reference Bible here, and it says, Praise to the God of creation. And that really does summarize this psalm very nicely. Let's begin here. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor, with honor and majesty, who covers thyself of light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angel spirits his ministers of flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with a deep as with, gar with, as with a garment, the water stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled, at the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that may, they may not pass over, that they not turn not again to cover the earth. He sendeth the springs into his valleys which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field, the wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation which sing among the branches. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that it may bring forth food out of the earth, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he hath planted, where the birds make their nests as for the stork, the fir trees are her house. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats, and the rocks for the conies. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun uh, knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. The sun ariseth, and they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and, small and great beasts. There go the ships, uh, there is that Lephiathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. That thou givest them, they, they gather. Thou openest thy hand, they are filled with good. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. They take us away, their breath, they die, and we turn to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looketh on the earth, and it trembleth. He toucheth the hills, and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. So a beautiful, beautiful psalm. Why don't we pray, and then we'll ask the Lord to help us understand it and uh, apply it properly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for life. Thank you for the privilege to open up your word tonight and for us to study it together as a church family, uh, to see the great creator behind these verses, to see your initial acts of creation, and then to see your continuing uh, sustaining of the universe, and especially our needs. We thank you for that. And um, we are encouraged and exhorted for this beautiful psalm to, to bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and to, to cry out at the end of this, hallelujah. And so, Lord, uh, may we worship you tonight. May you be pleased with our time together. May we have the proper understanding of the psalm, and uh, may we uh, glory in it in these moments. Lord, for our church family, you know the needs. We pray for Jonathan Rash. Uh, help him uh, to get over this issue with his breathing and some of the deterioration going on. Preserve his life. Give grace to him. Give grace to Gerilyn. We pray for Marilyn and Paula Duke and uh, the troubles that they've both had, and especially Paul with uh, this recent fall. We pray for the rehab time and for just his um, well-being physically, mentally, that you would sustain him. We pray for Bev Spenner. She goes into surgery tomorrow. We pray for others this week who, who are in the hospital and have other appointments uh, you know our, our frame, you know our weakness, and we just pray that you give strength to us physically. We pray, Lord, that tonight you would strengthen us in the inner man and that we would be refreshed in our spirit and that the word of God would have really free course in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this is a psalm that relates to creation, 
and uh, it is really a masterpiece. So I thought it might be good just to review the first six days of creation. On the seventh day, the Lord ceased from his creative work. He wasn't tired. He wasn't running out of energy or gas. Uh, he, he was finished with what he was, uh, his plan. And I believe that took place in six literal days. On the seventh day, he ceased from that creative work. And later uh, in, in the Pentateuch, it, it uses uh, that creation week as a, as a template for us doing work for six days and resting on the seventh. And so there's uh, some interesting things on sevens. Just for a review, day one, if you can think through the seven days, maybe. day one, what happened day one? Creation of the earth, no form or void. It's, it's not been filled yet. It's not been formed and shaped. It's just a big Play-Doh. It's, it has the materials, and uh, the Lord's going to shape it, fill it, and embellish it, and enhance it for the work of the Spirit. Um, but it's no form without form or void, as, as it's described. Darkness was upon the face of the earth. The Holy Spirit is going to energize this creation, and he is seen uh, moving upon the face of the waters. And on the first day, uh, we, we associate God's creative work of light. Let there be light. So day one, light. Uh, without a, a, a luminary source, there is not a, the sun or stars or other uh, luminaries. Uh, they're created on the fourth day. So God creates light day one. Day two, firmament. He divides the waters from the waters with the firmament in between. So there's waters above and waters below the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven. Uh, as we look at the topic of heaven, there's three heavens that are described in the scriptures. There's an atmospheric heaven. I think this one relates to that. There's a planetary heaven or the stellar heaven. We would call it maybe the universe and then the third heaven being the abode of God. So uh, this is that firmament that relates to the earth. Water's above it, water's below it. Day three, uh, the waters under the heaven, under the firmament, uh, those waters are seen described as being gathered into one place, and uh, that gathering of the waters is called seas, the seas, plural. And then uh, the dry land is being formed on day three, and it's called in that Genesis chapter, it's called earth. And so day three, you have uh, uh, the, the dry earth being described, um, perhaps surrounded by water, maybe one supercontinent, multiple seas surrounding it. But we have now earth. Shape is uh, being described. Uh, there on that uh, formation of the dry land, we now have vegetation created day three. We have grass, we have the herbs, we have the fruit trees, vegetation day three. Day four, the lights are created in the firmament of the heaven. I believe this is your stellar heaven, your planetary heaven. Uh, the clocks, the calendars are placed by God in the sky. Two great lights are especially emphasized, the sun and the moon, day four. Day five, lights in the firmament, lights in the second heaven. Uh, day four, the lights. Day five, water creatures created and air creatures, the fowl. So fish and birds, day five. Day six, land creatures, cattle, all the way to creeping things, the animal kingdom. And then God's great work, final work, his, his uh, climactic work, the creation of man in his image. And man was then commanded to have dominion over the water, the air, uh, and the land creatures, and um, was tasked to work in, in that beautiful garden that God placed them in. Seventh day, God rested from his creative work, and man was to follow suit and rest on the seventh day. So here we go. So we got the seven days. So as we walk into this psalm, guess how many units there are? There's seven units. And each of the seven units is emphasizing one day of the original creation. So if you walk through this psalm, not a chapter, this hymn, uh, seven distinct divisions. And just like with the creation week, the central day is, is the lights, the sun, the, the moon, the luminaries. So if you have an odd number, often the center point is your chiastic center. And as you work through this particular psalm, it is in the form of a chiasm. You probably already picked that up. Uh, how, how and why would you pick it up? Look at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You don't hear that very often. In fact, it's only found in the previous psalm. Psalm 103 starts and ends. So when you have a, 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 any verse or any paragraph or any psalm in this case, starting with a phrase like that, and then look how the psalm ends. Look at verse 35. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul. So how's the psalm start? With that phrase, bless the Lord, O my soul. It ends with that same phrase, bless the Lord, O my soul, and then tacked on at the end is a screaming hallelujah. Okay. So this is technically, technically called an inclusio. Uh, they're bookends. So it starts and ends with the same phrases. And usually that's a tip that this thing has incredible symmetry, tremendous literary design, and typically they're chiastic structures, and this is uh, no exception to that. We don't know uh, specifically who wrote the psalm. Um, at least in the Hebrew Bible, there's no superscription at the top. Usually if we know who wrote it, you'll see a psalm of David or whatever. Uh, the, the Jews have an interesting way to describe or define who, who writes the psalms, and we probably could apply it to, into this situation. Uh, but with your Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, and the Latin Vulgate, they do have superscriptions in those two Bibles and those two translations. And at the top, it says a Psalm of David. A Psalm of David. And if you go back to Psalm 103, look at the very top here, it says a Psalm of David. So the way the Jews reckon the Psalms as to authorship, if you have an author stated and the next Psalm does not have an author stated, they usually carry over the same authorship. In this case, it's pretty clear that the author is the same. Holy Spirit, yes, but when you study both Psalm 103 and 104, it's quite apparent that it's the same author. It's David. It's David. So Psalm 103 is going to end with that inclusio and ends with this cosmic burst of praise, and then Psalm 104 just builds on, on, uh, on that cosmology, the creation. So it's a, a beautiful psalm. So Psalm 104 picks off where Psalm 103 leaves off. Friends, Franz Delitz. Delitz, Kylan Delitz, I, I don't use their commentaries a lot. They're too technical. Um, I don't find a lot of help, quite frankly, unless you really are good at Hebrew, and I'm not. Uh, but I like what Franz Delitz, how he classifies this psalm. He calls it, Hymn in Honor of the God of the Seven Days. The Hymn in Honor of the God of the Seven Days. And as stated, uh, these, the, the seven days of creation, we're going to see reinforced throughout the whole psalm, seven divisions and this is not uncommon in the psalms to have a creation theme in fact 50 of the 150 psalms have creation themes in fact there's more verses on creation in the psalms than there is in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 so we have a lot of information in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 but oh my the psalms are just you have even more material related to, to, to creation obviously this is a poem 40% of the Old Testament is poetry, not uncommon. Uh, as you work through the psalm, you have to get the perspective of the author. He is going to trace the seven days of the creation week. And we'll, we'll, you'll see it in a moment. Uh, but he's writing from around a 1000 BC perspective. Uh, he's writing from a, from a fallen world condition. Uh, you're going to see animals going after uh, other animals in this psalm. You know, so meat eaters, predators, this is after sin. Uh, the last verse talks about a request, Lord, get rid of the sinners, the, the wicked. You know, remove them. Uh, that's, that's sin. That's a, that's a fallen world. And there's a, a number of indicators that this is a, an interesting time period uh, as, to, as, to, as to sin. But the backdrop of the psalm is the creation week. So David's looking back at creation. He sees a lot of things currently. And what he sees currently is how God sustained his creation. But he goes all the way back to the creation week and he's going to basically run a commentary poetically on the Genesis account. So this is an extremely rich uh, psalm. And what you're going to see in the chiastic structure of the psalm is you're going to have an in introduction, we'll call it that first inclusio, bless the Lord, O my soul. And that's going to parallel the last phrase in, in verse 35 where it says bless the Lord O my soul so that's the conclusion so you have an introduction and a conclusion the inclusios that parallel each other and then day one uh, is praising the Lord in, in a particular theophany and uses the, the name for God Yahweh and he says Yahweh my God he stresses that title those names and in day six day 7, excuse me, in verses 31 through 35, you have a theophany and praise, the order's reversed, and you have also the stress on the word Yahweh, my God. So Yahweh, my Elohim, 
And, and you have deliberate word choices for God in, in verses 1b and 2a, to 2a and verses 31 through 35a. And they parallel. And then you keep working to your, your axis to the middle part of the psalm. So day 2, uh, in verses 2b to verse 4, it emphasizes the wind, spirit, or breath, and it, picks, it selects a particular Hebrew word, ruach, uh, and it uses that word twice. And you can translate that, spirit or wind, it, the context determines how you translate it, but it's used twice. And then in day 6, verses 27 through 30, the emphasis is upon the spirit or breath, and the Hebrew word ruach is used twice. So what's happening, the, the author is clearly grouping parallel passages or themes, just tying them, linking them together, working to a central, central point. Uh, day 3, verses 5 through 18, the emphasis is upon the deep and the seawaters and the springs. And that, and that parallels day 5, an emphasis upon the sea and its moving things. Parallels, incredible word choices to link those two together. And the key to the, the psalm, the central part, is verses 19 through 14 in day 4. So the chiastic center of the book deals with, with the, the moon, the sun, and then there's this huge break after day 4 where you have the centering text uh, in verse 24. So if you want to mark that the heart of the psalm here is verse 24. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. They're just variegated. They're incredible. There's so many of them. And then he says like he's going to, you know, he, his, his son's going to build on this text. So it says, in wisdom hast thou made them all. And you're going to see wisdom being brought up by Solomon in Proverbs 8, describing creation themes. Very powerful linkage there to his dad here. So in wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of your riches. So boom, this praise comes out to God right there, right at the heart after the, uh, the, after the fourth day is, is described. So what we're going to see here through this psalm is the seven days of creation. So as I, I work through the psalm here, I kind of put those days kind of ahead of the text. And so hopefully you'll remember the seven days of creation we started with. So let's begin here. So day one, we'll just, just give a big picture quick, over, overview real quick. So 104, 1 and 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. So that's day one. This is the creation of light. And notice how it's described in verse 2, where God is seen covered with light as you would a jacket, a cloak. And beautiful language describing God as light, is light. And it's interesting that the light in this text is focused upon God. And this is, the psalmist is setting the, 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 the tone, the, the tenor for this psalm. He's saying when it comes to creation, uh, creation is not uh, man-centered. So usually we're thinking creation. We were created day six, and it's all about me and us. And from the beginning of the psalm, you're going to see it's, this psalm is not man-centered, and it's not heliocentric. It's not heliocentric. It's not about creation. It's not about the sun and the luminaries. This psalm, we would say, is theocentric. Theocentric. It's centered in God. And it's focusing right from the beginning. This is describing the seven days of creation. It's a God-centered creation. So very, very rich. Very, very rich. And, you know, we need to have that flipped in our thinking. Okay, it's not about me. It's about God. <laughs> it's a God-centered work. We praise him for creation. Our, our, our students at the mines are saying, why is it so important, this creation thing? Why is it so important, a literal creation? What, what, what's, what, why, why are you making a lot of ado about this? It seems like, you know, Shakespeare, much ado about nothing. And we're saying, uh, well, actually, it's very important. We'll give you those reasons. So it's a theocentric psalm. So God has covered himself with, with light. And then, then he gets to day two, day two. And um, when we talk about day two, we're talking about um, the dividing the waters from the, from the waters. You have... Um, some things going on here, day two and day three. Um, let's look at this phrase. Who stretches out the heavens like a, like a curtain. Stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So let's just say, when, when we came here, the church put us in the west in our first night. 
We got in late. And they put us way up, I think floor six, I think. And we just assume when we wake up in the morning, it's probably looking at the mountains. And so when we got up in the morning, it was big curtains, big windows. We pushed those curtains to the sides. Whoa, there's the Rockies. Okay. And we hurled those curtains. Okay. So what you have being described here is God's creation of, of space, of the universe. And the imagery here is like pushing a curtain. So it's describing the expansion of the universe. And so, so when our scientists say, you know, it looks like things are moving at pretty good speeds, it looks like there's a starting point or at least uh, some cause perhaps to create this effect, but this thing's traveling. It seems to be growing or expanding or at least going in a direction. And we say, yeah, I, I can see that right here in our text. It wasn't a big bang, but God's creative work, he's telling you something when he creates the space. There's some expanse going on, just like you'd push the curtains in a direction. So a beautiful description here. Uh, verse 3, we're talking about the third day, about the waters under, under the, for, uh, day 2 actually, under, the waters under the ferment and above it. L look at verse 3, who lays the beams, referring to God, lays the beams of his chambers. So he's building something. It's a very figurative language. God is building something. We would call this a theophany perhaps. But here, here God is building the beams of his chambers. Where chambers here is the upper, his, the upper room in the waters. So when you tie the whole text together, it's describing God in, in poetic language that he is building a place to live. And he's building it in the rain clouds, in the, in the rain system. And he goes on and builds around this, this really neat theme uh, being described here, who makes the clouds his chariot. So you have the, the rain clouds being described here where he's building his upper chambers. Great, great vantage point. A lot of thunder lightning can come out of those chambers. Who walks upon the wings of the wind. So let's say you're flying and you see those beautiful clouds. You're above the clouds. You say, man, I'd just like to walk out. If I could get out of this plane, I would love to just hang out and like it and just walk across the wind and walk across these clouds. So it's describing God's here in, involved in his creation in verse 3, who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks upon the wings of the winds, who makes his angel spirits. So there is a theological question, which day did God create the angels? They're not infinite beings. Um, typically you see early on in the creation Job talks about them, Psalms talks about them and it looks like they are created very early on in the creation week so they can watch God do his creative work and just sing praises unto God as they see the whole thing unfold they're very interested in God's creation and these are made into you know, ministering spirits as ministers of flaming fire and there's some, some interesting kingly themes here, We're describing God's pavilion as I tried to describe, a palace, his chariot, his messengers, and here his couriers, uh, the angels, his ministering spirits, who laid the foundation of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Well, that's encouraging. Uh, the verb here, should be removed, or should not be removed, removed. It says, it's saying it won't sway. The earth isn't going to stagger like a drunk. It won't, uh, won't teeter-totter but it's going to remain forever. And it's interesting the word forever, the Hebrew word is olam. It has two meanings, context determines. It can mean a long time or it can mean forever. Your context will determine which use you put in. And so here we see the earth's foundations and then it describes this part of creation. I believe it's um, day two where it says thou coverest it, this creation, this earth, with the deep as with a garment. And the word deep here is exactly the same Hebrew word that you would find in Genesis 1 2, where it says, And the darkness was over the surface of the deep. And he's describing here, the word deep is describing really the primeval oceans, these water bodies. So covering the earth like a coat were the waters, these oceans, these, this water body. And in fact, the water stood above the mountains, above the mountains. And there is some theological debate on this text. Some will say this is describing the first, you know, first week of creation. Some are going to say it's describing 
describing the flood. And some would step back and say, you know what? He's describing the first week of creation, but from his perspective, 1000 BC, the flood's already happened. And that's likely what is in view here. So what we have is, is this original, I think, the creation week that is described, where God creates the earth with no form or void. He creates light day one. Day two divides the waters from the waters. Day three, he gathers the water into, into the seas. And then the dry land is formed. And I think that's what's being described here. So the earth initially was covered by water. And then God here on day three gathers the waters that stood over the earth and then creates these mountains. So basically what you have is the rise of the mountains and the sinking of these valleys. And a major shift in land and sea, major shift of water, voluminous amount of water being moved off of what would become the continents that we, would, we, we can see evidence of and actually today live on. Uh, at least today. Uh, so what we have here is that water covering the earth and even the higher points and then you have a serious shift here where God just speaks the word day, day three at thy rebuke they fled at the voice of your thunder uh, they hasted away. Again God has his pavilion there in, in the sky uh, with that description there at the opening. And look at the verbs here that are used. He rebukes the waters that covered the earth and they fled. So have you ever fled from anything? I, I remember with Slow Joe, this is really embarrassing. I, I, I made this thing right so I can tell you. So Slow Joe, we're at Stone Harbor, New Jersey and Joe says, you know what, your parents have been so nice, you've been so nice, they invite me to, the, to this week at the beach. I'd like to take you out for breakfast. I said, wow, Joe, you've never done anything like this in your life. Really? He said, yeah, let's go to Uncle Bill's Pancake House right down the road. I said, that'd be great. Let's go. So we went down and Joe said, look, just order whatever you want. Eat as much as you want. I got you. So we sat there and we ate and we ate and we ate at Uncle Bill's Pancake House. And um, we were nearing the end of our meal. I'm expecting the, the waitress to give a check and for Joe to pay it. Uh, what I didn't know is Joe had other plans and his plans was to do a stage right exit. So Joe got up and I just remained at my, my table, the, our table, and Joe got up, went to the door, and he ran. I mean, booked. I mean, Joe was fast. He was dumb and slow, but he was really fast. And so slow Joe is just fleeing from the restaurant. And I'm looking. I'm trying to figure out my wallet. Do I have any money? Do I have enough to pay this bill? No, I don't. So just this is, I'm not real proud of this, but I made a decision. You know what? I'm getting out of here, too. I'm getting out of here, too. So I got up and I fled. And I tell you what, I wasn't as fast as Joe, but I ran fast because what happened when Joe ran out, one of the workers saw Joe bolt, went back into the kitchen and told the workers, there's some guys fleeing and come out here and try to help me get them. Well, you're not going to catch Joe. <laughs> Maybe he'll catch me, but you're not going to catch Joe. And I fled. I ran. I mean, I bolted. Okay. Years later, I've told this story. It's a great story. I was hunting in Pennsylvania at my brother-in-law's place in Bradford County. And he would invite these flatlanders from New Jersey up to hunt with him. And he would always say to these hunters, when, when my, my brother-in-law Will comes, he's a preacher, if you can just kind of chill out and not cuss as much when he's here, I'd appreciate it. And then he would say to me, now Will, when my friends come, these flatlanders are not Christians as you are, so if you don't mind, don't preach at them. So he was trying to insulate this wonderful lunch. We got together at lunch, and I started talking with the flatlanders. I asked them where they're from. The one guy said, I'm from Stone Harbor. I said, Really? I said, we used to go to Stone Harbor. What do you do? He says, I'm in the restaurant business. I said, really? What, what restaurant do you work at? Or, or, he says, well, I actually own a restaurant. Several. I said, really? Which one? He says, yeah, I own Uncle Bill's Pancake House. It's a family business. I said, you've got to be kidding. How long has this family been owned? You know, has owned this place? He said, well, long, yeah, whatever it was. And I just reached in my wallet, and I had a $20 bill, and I just gave it to him. Just gave him the $20 bill. And he said, What's this? what is this for? And I said, it's a long overdue debt. Let's just say it's good. And then I told him the story, and then I preached to him. So, um, so it was a really, really good story. Uh, the point is, Joe, when he, you know, he, when he left that restaurant, man, did he run. And uh, the water here is being described. God says the word, and it's, it's moving fast. At the voice of your thunder, they hasted away. They fled. They, they ran away. In a hurry is the idea. So here you have, a, I think, a lot of 
plate shifting, a continent being built, water coming off of that continent, enormous erosion, enormous runoff, likely tidal waves being created, a lot of stuff going on here on day three. Massive, massive movement of, of soil and water and the, the dry uh, continent or continents being formed on, on day three. Um, he goes on to describe, I think from his perspective, post-flood, that there's boundaries that, that this earth and these seas will not exceed, especially the waters, and that there's this promise that they wouldn't again cover the earth. So I think from a, from a Davidic post-flood viewpoint. And then he describes the springs you know, into the valleys, the headwaters from the mountains is being described there, which run among the hills. And then he talks about the land creatures, verse 11. The air, the air of the fowls in verse 12. He talks about you know, watering the earth from his chambers, going back to that cloud formation uh, with water. Uh, water or irrigating. I love the verb here, verse 13. He watereth the hills. He irrigates the hills from his chambers. Make sure that they're provided for. Uh, we have the cattle here, day 6, verse 14. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle. You have the vegetation back earlier with the, with the dry earth, and you have the, the olive trees, and you have the vineyards, and you have the fruit trees. You have, in verse 16, trees filled with sap. You have the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, you go back, kind of back, it's kind of fluctuating here between days. You go back to the birds on day, uh, you know, day 5 and verse 17. Verse 18, we're back to, to land animals on day 6, describing wild goats. That's the ibex. What are conies? I love conies. I like conies with, with mustard and col uh, with uh, sauerkraut. Maybe a little relish and definitely onions. I mean, there's nothing like a New York Coney. And uh, we have Colorado Coney's, a little different than these, than the New York Coney's, but I like both, both. So Coney's, the rock badger here being described. Uh, again, back to the land animals, day six. And then we get to day four, the central point of the psalm. Uh, moon, sun, day. So verse 14, he appointed the moon for seasons. That's, that's, Gen that's Genesis creation talk. A commentary now is being given on the creation of these clocks. The sun knows it's going down, knows where it goes at night. Light and darkness motif here, verse 20. He made darkness, and it's night. And then he talks about the day and the sun rising, verse 22, kind of doing that creation order, night and day, 24-hour periods. Uh, we have man placed in the garden to work, verse 23. Man goes forth into his work. He works all day until the evening, unless you work a night shift. And so you have here you know, man being placed in the garden, placed in creation to work. And then you have this burst of praise, the, the, the axis of the psalm, verse 24, back to that, how manifold are thy works. And then what you're saying, as you go from this point to the end of the psalm, you have all these repeated themes. You're saying, why didn't he just lump them all together? Why didn't he just say, day one, all these things, day two, all these things? Why, why do we have what looks to be something random? No, it's not random, it's chiastic. So he has some statements about certain topics, and he's reserved some ideas about the same topic to just parallel each other. Out, uh, on each side of the, uh, on the uh, on each side of the axis, and he talks about the sea creatures uh, in verse 25. So sea creatures, day five. Uh, one of those sea creatures is Leviathan. Uh, that that's a fantastic creature. Verse 26. You know, Job tells us in great detail what that creature's like. Unbelievable creature. One of God's greatest works. Unbelievable. And it's interesting that David is just describing the Leviathan as like, uh, you know, we you know, have the ships out there and occasionally you'll see a Leviathan. So they're not extinct at this time. They're not extinct at this time. During day, Job's days, they weren't extinct at that time. So uh, some would call this a sea dinosaur, and there's an amazing description of it, very complex description, Job. Uh, day six, you, you have some things going on here. And, uh, and so forth. It's interesting, day seven, very subtle. Day seven is a sabbatical, it's a rest. And there's some interesting rest themes and some Sinai uh, allusions where you have the, the Smoky Mountains, not the Rockies, but the Smokies in verse 32. He looks on the earth and trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. I think smoking's bad, but I think this smoke was good. And so you have here some very subtle um, memory ties back to Mount Sinai where the mountains on on fire, there's smoke and so on. And verse 33, we're coming to the end, you know, as I as I reflect why why I have sabbatic 
meditations. I'm going to sing to the Lord. I'm going to think of the Lord. I'm going to think of his creation. I'm going to look, I'm going to think of his preservation of his creation. And I'm going to sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise my God while I live and have my being. I'm going to just always do this. And I'm going to meditate. I'm going to, I'm going to worship him. I'm going to meditate on him. And my meditation of him, it's, it's going to be sweet. I'll be glad in the Lord. I'm going to rest in him. And of course, uh, you have this incredible statement, let the sinners be consumed out of the earth. There will be an, an enormous Sabbath rest. The millennium, in many ways, is inching forward toward the eternal rest that follows the millennium. Let the wicked be no more. And then he concludes with the inclusio. Bless thou the Lord. O my soul, praise ye the Lord. And uh, the verb there, praise, and if you might have the translation, hallelujah, hallelujah. So this thing just takes you through the seven days of creation. Comments are being made, and we're to step back and say, wow, look at creation. We know the creator. Look at what he initially did, and look at how he has sustained it. And wow, great grounds for the worship of God. So very, very, very powerful psalm, Psalm 104. Okay, we're going to stop right here, and I've given Steve kind of some guidelines for the video. We won't go long, about 20 minutes. Same professor from, um, from Australia will be speaking. And I want you just to hear a little bit about the creation week and young earth ideas. We'll go about 20 minutes, and then I'll come back and make a comment or two, and we'll close in prayer at that point. So Dr. Schnelling, Noah's flood and the age of the earth. <laughs> 